Thank you so much, uh, our Dean, for that. And right away, allow me to once again welcome Reverend uh, Canon Dr. John Sinyoni and Canon Dr. Ruth to the floor. You're most welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Tawera. Um, now, Dr. Ruth is on the road, actually. She will be contributing. Uh, but you may have to make yes. do with my boring voice most of the time. No, I'm here. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, so I she's the... I you and I'm present. Present, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's around. So, um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for the semester. I think everything has gone smoothly. And we are also thankful to hear that uh, you've not had incidents uh, that cause worry. And so thank you very much, Dean. Thank you, Tawera. Thank you, all those that have been facilitating uh, this time and uh, even before we take a break. Now, today, we are mainly focusing on the questions that were given to us. There are not very many. Uh, but obviously some of them are quite pregnant. And uh, I'll just go, you know, there's question one, question two, question three, and question four. I think that's what it is. So I'll go one by one. And uh, Dr. Ruth may make her own contributions, but let me uh, kick off at this moment. The first question had four parts but all of them related to the same thing. And uh, the so first of all, the first part was saying, what does the Bible say about women wearing trousers? <laughs> about women wearing trousers? That was a very interesting question. And um, then it is followed with another question, at what point is a woman supposed to wear trousers? The third part says, is it appreciated by men for women wearing trousers? And then uh, fourth part, if so, what type of trousers are they supposed to wear? Uh, now, take note, uh, the person who asked this question, if she's online, um, that uh, there is a part there that's not ours. It's really FACURE management, so we aren't going to try and respond to it. So let me see, what does the Bible say about women wearing trousers? The simple answer is nothing. You know, uh, we need to understand that that was not the wear for the days when the Bible was written. So obviously they couldn't have read it's like cigarettes. How do you write about cigarettes when there are no people that are smoking cigarettes? You know nothing about it. So there's nothing that is said about women wearing trousers. However, the Bible says something about women not wearing men's clothes or garments or men wearing women's garments. That's all it really says in Deuteronomy 22 verse 5. Now, having said that, someone might say, oh, but then trousers are for men. Well, if you go into a shop, you'll find that there are trousers for men and there are trousers for women. And um, if you are a woman, try putting on a man's trouser. If you're a man, try putting on a woman's trouser. And you'll immediately realize it's not made for your physique. So essentially, when we talk about trousers generically, we need to be very careful that uh, we, we, there are two types of trousers. There are trousers for men and there are trousers for women. To the best of my knowledge, the people who try to put on, uh, which is called uh, cross-dressing, people of the opposite sex tend to be the transgender people. Um, I, I mean, the, the, I don't want to go that way. There's just too much. Um, the kind of adjustment that people try to do. But otherwise, when you see women wearing trousers, it's not because they are wearing men's trousers. They are actually wearing women's trousers. They are not men's trousers. 
So the Bible doesn't say anything. And uh, the next question, at what point is a woman supposed to wear trousers? I think in a sense is already answered uh, within, it's, a, it's implicit in what I've just said here. And then there is a question, is it appreciated by men for women wearing trousers? Uh, you know, that's a very difficult question to answer. First of all, it is personal. Uh, there are men, indeed, who may appreciate them, others may not. Secondly, it is also cultural. Just like in the day, in those days, you know, or in any culture, you do find that there is wear for men, there is wear for women. So there is also the cultural aspect that you've got to deal with. But thirdly, it can also be contextual. You know, contextual in the sense that the job you are doing may require you to put on trousers. But also some people may just have preference. So I really can't say whether men will appreciate women wearing trousers or not. It's very difficult for us to generalize on an issue like this. Let me just say, go to the fourth, and then I'll see if Dr. Ruth has something additional. So it says, if so, what type of trousers are they supposed to wear? And I think I've already answered that. So Dr. Ruth, do you have something you want to say? Um, what I can add to that is that um, women, men, need to be decent mm -hmm. very important decency because there are some kind of trousers these days that people are wearing i don't think they're even called trousers i think they are called these these skin skin things you know it's like you are really naked there's one i saw who was wearing a brown one and at first i looked again and looked again and i'm like is this person wearing anything you know, mm. so there are so many things that are inappropriate for the culture, inappropriate for walking around in public. There are some things you can wear in your house and there are some things you can go with a wedding uh, to a wedding with. So you have to learn how to dress appropriately. Now, when mm. someone says, do men like this? It also puts my ears up. and say, are you dark sometimes? I mean, we saw, and the men want to touch your bottom because it is so tight and it is so showing. So we need to be careful that we are not putting on our clothes so that the men can see or can look. That is a very, as John said, pregnant question. Will, mm -hmm. will, do the men appreciate it? I mean, I'm not wearing for men to appreciate it. I'm wearing to be decent so that when I walk around, my breasts are not out, my bottom is not peeping out, my pants are not showing where they are passing. Basically, that's it. Mm. So trousers sometimes are a very personal issue. You can put them on, but culturally, and sometimes people in church, in fact, many years ago, they never used to allow you to go up for Holy Communion if you are wearing trousers you had to either tie something around your, yourself. So things have changed. And uh, right now, I think trousers are in fashion. Everybody wears trousers and shorts. However, as a Christian, how are you presenting yourself? That is the big question. Are you decent if someone looks at you? Can they respect you? I think, Daddy, maybe you can you can address that issue where, you know, when you see someone and you think, are they prostitutes? Because that's mm -hmm. sometimes what men see. They see you as somebody who is so loose, yeah. who is such a prostitute. I don't think mm. I, I they think want to be seen in that kind of... Yeah, you are breaking up a little bit. But uh, I think the major thing that we that has come out is the issue of decency. And by the way, that's not just for women. It's also for men. Because there are men who wear trousers below their waist, but trousers are made for your waist. 
uh, or who wear them dirty and things like that. Those are things, what we need to understand first and foremost is that our dressing communicates, communicates. So uh, when a man, particularly men use their eyes, and I think we have addressed this many times, that their eyes carry messages to the brain. If you're wearing a body hugging trouser, and it may even be a dress, it doesn't have to be just a trouser, but once it's body hugging, you are communicating that you are not worthy of marriage, you are more worthy of sleeping with. You see? So you need to be mindful of these things. Now, the problem is when a woman wears, she's wearing as a woman, and does not understand that in the man's mind, it's a very different story. I wouldn't want to walk around with my wife where everybody is turning and looking at her bottom. So I wouldn't marry someone like that. I want to marry someone who dresses decently and I feel proud that I have a wife of that nature. So please watch the issue of decency is critical, not only for women, but of course women tend to be targeted a lot more because your fashions tend to pronounce your body more than ours. So please keep that in mind. Can we move to the next? Because I think we've taken some time on that. Okay. So the next one, what does it mean to have a spiritual husband when you're not married? Um, to be honest, this was the first time I'm coming across the terminology. I don't know, darling, if you've come across spiritual husband. Uh, but you know, the moment you use the word husband, you are actually beginning to mislead and the relationship itself may lead you into problems. I mean, why do you have to say spiritual husband? Why don't you say spiritual mentor, if that's what you really mean, or someone that you look up to and so forth? But once you say spiritual husband, then it has connotations that can be misleading and they, they, they may make you prone to abuse. So, um, you know, let me talk I about I understand numbers. it. Maybe let me just say the way I, I understand it. There are people at night who in their dream or in their sleep, they get these things of someone sleeping with them. So they wake up like somebody has been sleeping with them. And usually that's what they call spiritual husband. You know, someone who does that in the spirit. And there, there are people who, who pray around that and, and, ex, and uh, take out the demons of spiritual husbands. I think that's what they're asking. So when you are sleeping at night, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, somebody comes and sleeps with you. For, for me, in, in your dream. So for me, it is um, something um, in, inside there that you have to watch, particularly what kind of things you are um, accessing and Running what kind of life you are living and what your background has been, you know. Many times if we've been abused, raped, uh, sexually raped, uh, abused, or defiled when we were young. Some of these things come back in that kind of way. Okay, mm -hmm. and some of some some people have been given in as um, um, as sacrifices to 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 Satan. So this also requires a lot of coming close to God and allowing Him to protect you from such mm. things if you leave you know there, there's a verse in the bible which says don't give the devil a what a chance don't yeah. give him even an opening but it's some of us we are in church one foot is in church another foot is in witchcraft one foot you know you want money so you you, you put the other foot somewhere else so that kind of life opens up opens you up into areas which you cannot even see, even cannot think, because we are fighting sp spiritual wars day and night, but you shouldn't be having spiritual husbands. 
Yeah. So, I mean, if it is something that is coming in dreams, you really need to consider uh, having prayer over it. Uh, it may just be that you are indeed, your mind is filled or you're reading things or you're watching movies and so on. And I will be saying something about that later. Uh, so be very, very careful. I, I don't think I would encourage the language spiritual husband. If it is within your sleep, then it needs to come to a stop. Okay, the next one is what can you do when you love someone, but he doesn't love you? Darling, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't just, just leave. Well, um, mm. just a word or two. If, if someone doesn't love you, mm. especially if a man's heart is not, is not coming to you, then sometimes I feel it's a waste of time because if you get into any kind of relationship and you are the one pushing and pulling and, and following and, you know, you want that man, you know, that, that's going to be an uphill relationship. It should be that you love him and he loves you. That's the best that can happen. Uh, yeah, that's my view. Yeah, so I think really move on. Uh, the problem is in relationships, sometimes we get to a point where we just feel like there's no life outside that one person. And that is a lie. There's life outside that person. Secondly, also keep in mind that just as you have a choice on who you love, on who you want to relate with, that he also has that choice. You know? So, when we got married, I proposed, I mean, when we got into a relationship, I proposed to my wife, but she had to accept for us to go forward. If she hadn't accepted, I would have moved on. So you need to be aware that it takes two to tango, as they say. That I'm two glad I accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I am so happy I don't have any regrets. Yeah. yeah. So please keep in mind, God made so many other men, so many other people. Your person does not need to be that person. Now you may hold on. And when you hold on to that person, let me tell you, my dear friend, if that person turned around, that could be hell for you. So just move on. Okay, next question, because we need to move on. Is there a possibility for people to know what other people are thinking? Uh, and in parenthesis there, they put prophecy or revelation to know what other people are thinking. Now, let me first of all say that uh, God gave us various modes of communication with other people. We usually talk about this when we are preparing people for marriage. We, the, God gave us many ways. Right now, as I speak, I'm communicating. When you see my hands here, I'm gesturing, therefore I'm communicating. When you see my head moving and it's not just still and I'm talking, you know, you know that there is some communication. Sometimes I'm very passionate, sometimes it, I'm very calm and so forth. All these communicate. Now, listen, God gave us these communication modes to use them. Those, that is the primary <coughs> way that we should be communicating. So this whole business of trying to understand people's mind, mind, or what they are thinking can lead one into doubling with the, the, the devilish spirituality. Because I've known about that, that the devil quite often makes us think, I want to know what the other person is thinking, and so now you struggle and you're trying to get to understand what the other person says. Now, on occasion, when you say uh, prophecy or revelation, occasionally God will reveal about another person. But when God does that, there is a purpose to it. This is, first of all, that's not the common way. And that's why I started by saying that it's not the common way for him to communicate to us. God prefers that we communicate, first of all, ordinarily, ordinarily, okay? And quite often people who get, you know, who say, I have a prophecy, I have a revelation, 
they use it to abuse others. When I was at university, and I think some of you may have heard this one, there were young men who would go to a girl and they say, hmm, the Lord is showing me you are the one that I should marry. <laughs> you know, how did he show you? You know, if he showed you, then let him show me as well. Let him show me. Because this God who reveals makes it clear both ways so that you enter marriage when you know. If we were to tell your own story, I think it's very clear that's what happened. So when God reveals or gives you a prophecy, it is usually for a much higher purpose than our selfish interests. So for example, someone may have a sin in their life and God wants them to repent. So he may reveal it to you. And I can tell you, we better be fearful when God does that. Because when he does it, he wants you to go and talk to the other person. And you may start quaking. So let's not think of that very lightly. It's usually for a much higher purpose. The prophecies in the Bible, the revelations in the Bible, were not things that were just being revealed as ordinary things. Now, I am aware, and I will say this last and then see if Ruth has something more to say. There are many pastors who have abused this. And they go around claiming that God has revealed to them. In the first place, those pastors, some of these pastors, they tend to have a revelation every time they are preaching. Friends, that is abuse of what prophecy, of what revelation is all about. We are firm, yes, God does reveal prophecies. God does reveal his truths. It's for a higher purpose and it's not the ordinary way of communicating. Ruth, do you have something more to say? Darling, are you, you are muted if you're trying to speak. Did you have something more? You're muted? Okay, maybe I can move. Okay. Uh, okay. So we go ahead. Okay. Uh, someone here says, uh, I have attended many character building sessions and I realize I'm very far from being a person with a good character. Now, before the question, let me just commend you for saying that. Being very far from character. It's a positive thing when you are able um, to see. You yeah. need to be better. So I don't think I have anything king of when one have the capability. Oh. I think uh, I had gone off, but I think I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's avoid um, thinking that people can think for us or see what we are thinking or plan for us or have visions for us. Let's try to get as close to God as possible. Try to find out what he wants us to do. Live righteously and follow. Read his word. That is the best I would say. Instead of going to the pastor and saying, Pastor, you know, I've seen this guy and I want to marry him. What does God say? You can't, you can't, you can't, he can't know what the other guy is thinking. But if you really want to marry someone, you need to communicate and say, you know what? I think I like you. And they'll say, I don't like you. Then you move on. Now in the comments, someone said, it's not easy to move on. It's not easy to move on, but it's also a waste of time to stay there because you are not going to get gain anything by staying there. Or you get into a bad marriage, which you regret. I was just adding those two together. I okay. hope that helps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we are not saying that moving on is easy. Please understand that because there are feelings involved and feelings don't follow reason, <laughs> you know? They don't follow reason. So you may reason, I must move on, but the feelings will keep on for some time. But just know that unless you make a decision of the will to move on, then the feelings will keep concentrating and they will keep on thinking and they will keep on resting there. Okay. 
uh, I had moved to the next question. Uh, someone who said that uh, they are very far from being a person of good character. And I said, I think that's a good thing. You are in a very good place. Because one of the worst parts that many people go through is when they fail, they, they fail to realize that they are in the wrong place. Okay? They don't know, and they don't know that they don't know. It's very important. The very first step to change is always to know I am in the wrong place and I want to move on. So the question that follows is how can I start the journey of bettering my character? How can I start the journey of making my character better? Darling, do you want to say something about that before I move on? Uh, you are muted, you are muted. Okay, uh, she's still muted, let, let, let me move on and just say, starting that journey. First of all, for us to understand character is formed. Character is formed. It's not going to come like a revelation. It's not going to come like a miracle. No. Um, yes, I think the first thing is to be aware. I am, no, I'm not. Are you talking? Okay, so character is formed. Uh, you're breaking up. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. You may have to go off and come in again. I don't know. Okay, let me just go on. So character is formed and it's mainly through two avenues. We talked about these long ago when we were... When we were talking about um, the character building, when we're introducing it, one of them is religious affiliation. Very, very important. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more. And the other is cultural exposure. What culture are you exposed to? And when I say cultural exposure, I'm going to try and elaborate. I'm not simply talking about your tribal culture. I'm talking about something much larger. Okay, now, culture, usually involves what the parents, what your family have passed on to you. It involves what kind of company are you keeping? It involves what are you feeding your mind with, either by, the way, by way of what you watch or what you read, uh, or what are you feeding your heart? All these are aspects that influence culture. Okay, if I have a friend, if I have friends and those friends are gamblers, chances are I will start looking at gambling as something that I also can participate in. Of course, it begins with maybe even objection. Then you go to toleration. And before you know it, you start accepting. That's what I'm talking about that that's how culture is formed. So it can be formed through family, it can be formed through the company you keep, even the school that you go to. So they are, the whole environment around you is part of that cultural formation, which eventually affects your cultural commitments, okay? Now, keep in mind, you cannot choose your parents or your siblings or your family or your tribe. You cannot choose those, but you can choose your faith and you can choose your friends and you can choose what you watch and what you read. In other words, what you ingest, what you take in, what's going into your mind, into your brain, what is going into your heart. <clears throat> those are choices that you have got to make for yourself. And yet the moment you take them in, you are beginning to form character. You are beginning to form it, okay? Now, thirdly, I should say that your faith determines the company, determines what you read, determines what you watch, okay? 
When I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ 47 years ago as a university student, there are certain things I stopped doing. Why? Because I knew that Jesus is Lord of my life. And that was it. There are certain things that I immediately stopped. So your faith is very important in determining the friendships that you have and determining what else actually influences you. And my faith is the one that helps me even to judge the cultural distinctives that I may be observing. So for example, like I said, if I have friends who are gamblers, my faith will tell me no gambling and I will take a stand. I will take a stand. But if my faith is weak, or if it's not there, then it becomes much more difficult for me to do anything. And so what I normally advise people is that you need to weigh the worth, the value of each of those things that you're involved in, but against the faith that is hoping that you hold the true faith. And I'm going to come back to this faith thing because I think it's very important. You wear everything against the faith. So <clears throat> in Uganda, I mean, my wife and I don't take alcohol simply because our faith, in our faith, it's not like alcohol is so satanic and so forth, but we say we don't want to go that way for a number of reasons that I'm not going to go into. It would take me a lot of time. So when we go, when we've been traveling, in fact, when we travel abroad, especially to the Western world, you will see a Christian, evangelical, and they're taking their alcohol quite comfortably. Now, my faith is telling me, no, I'm not going to take it. So I do not, we do not take it wherever we are because our faith informs how we live, informs our character. And so that's why I'm emphasizing faith. Now, three things need to be said about faith. <clears throat> At least three things anyway. First and foremost, the Bible says Jesus is Lord. What does that mean to say that Jesus is Lord in Philippians 2 verse 11? It means that he's the one that determines everything that I do. So whatever situation I come to, I need to be able to weigh it against what does this mean to my Lord? Okay, so that is an important part that you need to have in mind. In fact, I like a statement that was made that either Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Either Jesus is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. So you need to be able to take Jesus, not just as Savior, but as Lord. For example, you have a girlfriend. How are you going to conduct yourself in that relationship? What does Jesus say? What does his Lordship mean in the relationship you're in? Those are things that you need to keep in mind. Secondly, the same Bible says, bad company spoils good morals. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company spoils good morals. And therefore, you want to be able, your faith informs what kind of company is called good, what kind of company is called bad. I've already said something about company. Friends, beware of what kind of company you keep. When you have a certain company, whether you like it or not, the people that you spend most time with. Say, for example, you get a job. And it is commonplace in the, in the office where you've got a job for them to take a bribe. It will take you your faith to stand up and say, I am going to stand apart. And I'm telling you, it's not always easy. I remember when I had just come to Christ, going to teach in a school where they spoke obscenities, and I knew that my life had come out of that kind of thing. They spoke obscenities in my presence to break me. 
Well, they didn't. Why? Because my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ said, the company I keep must be good. And you know what happened? I remember that very well. Eventually, they are the ones who changed. <laughs> they are the ones who changed. But beware of what company you keep. But thirdly, <clears throat> Philippians 4.8 also tells us what you think about. Philippians 4.8, you read these for yourselves later, but says, think about what is true, think about what is honorable, think about what is just, think about what is pure, and so on and so forth. In other words, what I fill my mind with will eventually influence how I live, my character. So if you want your character to change, and, and I've spent more time on this particular one, because this is the key thing. This, this, has, this is a character building session. If you want to build your character, watch what you put in your head. Okay, I may not be able to illustrate much more than that, but that's very important. Whether it's a movie or it's a song you listen to or it's a novel if you like reading or it is the places that you visit, then you need to ask yourself, what does my faith say about this kind of thing? So therefore, the principal and most godly influence for each one of us must be the Lord Jesus Christ and no one else. I think my wife is not yet back, so I can just move on uh, to the next one. Now, the next one, uh, still related to that was, are there any steps I can follow? Are there any steps I can follow? First and foremost, like I've said, surrender to Christ. Friends, the reason we emphasize that is because we know what Jesus did. We know what Jesus did. And I'm not talking about what he has done in other people's lives. I know how he changed me. How he changed me. From a liar to someone who, who does not only love truth, but actually speaks the truth. From someone who spoke obscenities to someone now who hates to hear those kinds of things. What? And you know, those things just, it was like a switch that God turned on, and suddenly I found myself hating these things. I cannot give the full testimony, but what I'm saying to you, first and foremost, the first step, surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, then you need to grow in Christ. You need to grow in Christ, and you know growth in Christ requires obedience to him, obedience to him. Things like, and I'll just give you four things. Things like prayer, okay, prayer, learning to pray over those things that have defeated you, over those things that you're finding difficult in your own life. Pray over them, but maybe sometimes you need another person to pray with you. You can go to the dean, <clears throat> you can go to a friend who is a Christian, and you say, please pray for me, okay? Two, read the Bible, reading the Bible. Very, very important. You need to have a systematic way of reading the Bible. The reading of the Bible is one of those ways that you ingest truth instead of lies. You ingest what is good instead of what is evil. You ingest right rather than what is wrong. So read your Bible every day. Three. Tell others about Jesus. If you have made a decision for Christ, uh, I don't have the time actually to tell you this, but let me say this. One of the things, one of the things that really, really supported me in those early days after I'd given my life to Christ was the fact that I had told my parents, I had told a very dear friend of mine that I was saved. They laughed, they did what? People jeered, people did all sorts of things. But when you tell others about Jesus, it strengthens your own faith. And finally, attend fellowship with others, other believers. Be in fellowship with other believers. And this means not only church, but even where there are gatherings of people reading the Bible, gathering of people, they are giving their testimonies. These, I can tell you those four things and I've summarized them. 
I could have said a lot more about them. Prayer, reading the Bible, telling others about Jesus or what they call witnessing, attending fellowship. And I can assure you, you will grow. And the rest is just obedience to the voice of Christ. Okay. Uh, let me just add something. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I had started to say that um, there is need for self-awareness where you are now. Because someone said, you know, I'm, I'm in a bad place, but I would like to be in a good place. So realize where you are and where you want to go. And also, real, so that is like awareness, no? That I'm, I'm struggling with this area, I'm struggling with the other area. So that when, when you are doing some changes, you know exactly what you need to work on. And then um, get the support that you need. Sometimes you may need to talk to a counselor, to You're, you're breaking again. A pastor. To, I'm struggling with this. Because sometimes again, okay. Yeah, I've stopped actually, but I don't know whether that helps. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I think, yeah. Now you you are clear. You're now clear. Go on. Uh -huh. Well, I'm sorry. We seem to be losing her and gaining yeah. her at the same time. We can't hear you. I may just have to go to the last question uh, that was there. Darling, I think, you know, you are not coming through. You're not coming through, sorry. You're not coming through. Okay, sorry, I don't think that is uh, that is working. And then she doesn't know that she's not coming through. Let me go to the last question. Uh, when she comes back, she will say what she wants to say. But apart from studies at Ecuray, I feel this is a good time to identify a future marriage partner. <clears throat> so the question is, what are the qualities we may look out for in a spouse to be? Uh, first of all, you know, since I'm talking to people who are in a touch, who are at a university level, I am quite aware that all of you, if you're not yet married, you are of marriageable age. You are above 18. You certainly, uh, your body and your whole composure is telling you that marriage is one of those things that you probably would want to go to. Okay, so that is a very normal thing, and thank you very much for that. But then it comes to the qualities. Now, when someone says qualities, I'm going to assume that the person wants a partner who is a good marriage partner, someone who has good qualities, someone who will fulfill you, and you say, okay, I won't have any trouble with this person. <clears throat> okay? So I'm going to start by saying this. The qualities that you want depend not, and please listen carefully, the qualities that you want depend not so much on what you desire or in the other person, but much more on the qualities you yourself have. Many times we think it's the other person who must have those qualities. But I want to tell you that if you're looking for a marriage partner, first put the torch in yourself, okay? Let me just switch on my torch here. 
And you see it, okay? Now, instead of pointing at the other person, point at yourself. Oops, it has gone off. So point at yourself. Don't point at another and say, do I have the qualities that I'm seeking in the other person? The point that I'm making here is that if you are a bad person, you are going to make hell for that person, that other person you want. So start with you. That's why character building is so important. Start with you. Don't start with other people. Because if you get a good person and you're a terrible person, can you imagine what hell you're going to lead that person into? Because you're saying, oh, this is the one, this is the best, this is what? No. Start with you, yourself. That's where it all starts. Mindful that another person will not make you good. It's you to be good to find a good person. It's you to have the, the kind of character that is attractive to others. That's really where you should be starting. Most importantly, if you are a Christian, the question I would ask you, are you walking faithfully in obedience to Christ? Are you walking in obedience to Christ? Once you answer that question in the affirmative, then the Bible is very clear. 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be equally yoked, do not be mismated with someone who is an unbeliever. So the very first thing that you would be saying, I am going to look for a Christian. Now, let me just tell you, when, when, when I met my wife, I was working on my PhD and I was living in Australia. She was here, she was doing her first degree. I came home <clears throat> and I was not at that particular time thinking that, ah, let me get a girl and, and so forth. However, all along, I had one thing in my mind. I am a Christian. I believe in Jesus and I'm committed to him. I want to obey him. If God brings a girl my way, I only want one quality. <laughs> only one quality. And that quality is she too must be obedient to Christ. Friends, we can ask for all sorts of other qualities. She must be beautiful. She must be this height. She must have this kind of nose. She must come from that other that, 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 that tribe and so on and so forth. All that is rubbish. Okay? It is all rubbish. The important thing, first of all, starts with you. And once you are done with you being a good person, then you can, or being a, a Christian who is obedient to Christ, then you can find someone who is also obedient to Christ. And if that person, say for example, let me just take the example now <clears throat> with my wife, because I know that she's a believer. And I know that we keep, we've kept ourselves for each other. She's still out. The time now is coming to nine o'clock. Am I worried about her? No. Why? Because I know that as a Christian, the Christian that I know in her keeps her for me and for me alone. Similarly for her, she's not worried about me being in this house alone doing some mischief. Why? Because the husband that she looked for was one who believes in Christ and who is obedient to Christ. So essentially, start with you, start with you. And then there, is, there comes, if you have your life in Christ, you have only one fundamental quality to look for. And that fundamental quality, which is faithful obedience to Christ, will determine every other quality that you're looking for. It so happens that my wife is from the same tribe with me, but actually I was not looking for a person in my tribe. And I never said that I want to marry from my tribe. No. If she came from the same tribe, well, that is okay. 
I was not even asking, she must be this height. She must, you know, I have heard all sorts of things. So friends, that is what I would say to you concerning marriage partner. I don't think she's back yet, unfortunately. She's not yet back. Okay. I think Tawera, now I'm in your hands to do with as you please. Actually, I am here. I don't know oh. if you can hear me. I, I hear you, but I don't know why you can't hear me. We can, can hear you. Hear you me? Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. I think you you have really covered that part very, very well. There is need to pray, there is need to to better yourself so that they find you, not you finding, but that you are found good and you are find, found well. Yeah, I would, that, I, would, I would say exactly the same thing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Tawera, I think uh, we are 